Folks, welcome to the weekly webinar. Good to have you with us. Dr. James, alcoholic and generally bad person. Dr. Mike, much better than me in all regards, here to answer questions. All right, folks, since we are now YouTubing it and RP Plus is the way of the dinosaurs in a museum with children poking at it, let us get to the top 10 questions from this webinar. And the way we're doing that is we go to the last webinar, which happens to be the one recorded on July 21st. And we go through and the questions folks ask underneath, we answer the top 10. Top 10 means the top 10 most upvoted. Uh, and to some extent, uh, some of those will also be uh, ones that we find most interesting and most uh, kind of pertinent to answer and ones that we haven't answered before uh, as much. So if you really want your question to appear one of the weeks, ask people to upvote it. <laughs> uh, hopefully it's a good question. So James, ready to go? Yeah. Do you want me to start at the top and kind of work down or what are you thinking? You know what? So I'll start with, uh, I just scanned them. I'm going to start from the bottom and look at uh, from the bottom up to see if there's any very highly upvoted ones. There was one that was kind of low that was like uh, 12 voters. Yep, I saw that one. So we can start there and that's going to be Henry, Harry Small. Where did he go? Harry fucking Small. He's, uh, there he goes. Got it. Yep. James, on your YouTube, what is his, uh, the H, what color is that? Purple, right? Purple, yeah. Okay, cool. So I can actually just we can tell by the pictures. Okay, great. So Harry Small says, Hey docs, what are your thoughts on the significance of alcohol's impact on muscle growth? Jackson Pias, a good friend of ours actually, recently claimed on Revive Stronger podcast that the marginal optimality relating to hypertrophy training, such as twice a day training, and face potentiation become almost insignificant when people are consuming alcohol weekly. Do you even a into the muscle building process. Uh, so that's part one of his question. Um, I would say that alcohol, and James and I have uh, put out a lot of content relating to this, and we'll sort of reemphasize it right now. The effect of alcohol on muscle growth is uh, in a dose dependent manner um, and in a frequency dependent manner as well. If you drink uh, a beer here and there, it's almost going to impact nothing. Uh, if you drink a few beers here and there, it's going to compare like Jackson uh, sort of insinuated to some of the other super optimal stuff you do. Um, and there's nothing wrong with doing, trying to do like two a day training and also having a, a few drinks because then you essentially get like perfect one a day training results, but you can still drink. Um, so that doesn't necessarily speak to which way the trade off should be, but if you're having four to four plus beers or drinks per day, five days a week, you are significantly in impacting your athletic performance and muscle growth. And that is something you need to think about incrementally more and more. So yeah, drinking does impact muscle growth significantly, but it is dose dependent. It's not like one beer changes the game. It doesn't. Two beers, okay, it's starting to make an impact. Three, it's starting to make a real impact. Four, five, six is starting to be a, you're not really a serious athlete. So James? Yeah. And I think people make a very common mathematical mistake on this. Same thing with like the concurrent training stuff where they assume that alcohol in this case is um, we're taking away, uh, giving you like negative returns, right? In this case, you're just getting less positive returns the more you drink. So that means if you could be getting 100%, every time you start adding alcohol, you start shaving off little percentage points of what potential growth or adapt adaptations that you could have been making. So the idea here is that you're just making less positive gains, not making no gains or negative gains. There is a point in which you would get there, but you would likely uh, be suffering a lot of other life problems at that point before you really actually started to see like muscle loss from alcohol. Uh, you would your life would very likely be in shambles at that point. So for a variety of reasons. So just keep that in mind. It's not like, a, like it's the same thing when people say like, running's gonna like crush all your gains. No, it just means you're gonna have slightly less positive gains for a little while. That's all, same idea. Yeah, very good point. Number two for Harry Small, nearing the end of a long cut, my performance in the lower up ranges decreases, which is to be expected, I suppose. However, in the higher up range, specifically 20 30 reps per short performance continues to improve. Is this normal? If so, what is the reason? Or do you think it could be due to the fact that with lower rep ranges, you can't ride up reps in the same way as with higher reps, so you can't continue to force improvements? So the number one, there's two big reasons. One is that as a, a hypocaloric diet and the added activity people often do from cardio, though that's not required, just hypocaloric diet in general, uh, increases AMPK activity. 
uh, and AMPK uh, activity increased as a catabol, which is not good. But uh, it is actually um, uh, makes your ability to to exert. Uh, so it's, it's catabolic and it alters your fiber activity to a more slower twitch from faster twitch, which means you're going to get disproportionately weaker on heavy lifting for how much muscle you didn't lose. So even if you don't lose any muscle, you might get weaker on the heavier lifts and be like, what the hell? That's because you're less fast twitch oriented and your strength power is down, but it'll make you better at reps. So you'll actually just get better, slightly better endurance in addition to that. So that's part one, uh, a big part. Big part two is you lose fat, your endurance goes up anyway. A lot of the reason you think you're stopping sets of 20 to 30 reps when you're fat and happy it's because of your local muscles. It's not. It's because your system's like, go to hell. I can't keep up with this bullshit. But when you're lean, your endurance is fucking rock solid. And then your local muscles can actually be more of a limiting factor, which means they can do more of the work and have higher reps. So one thing that James and I like to do is when we're advising progressions in a fat loss phase, we like to take advantage of the slight conversion. And sometimes in deep at a fat loss phase, it's easier to add reps than it is to add load. Um, because if you add reps, you can get great progressions going, challenge yourself and at least psychologically be like, Hey, I'm like not being a piece of shit. And we also usually recommend that fat loss training definitely have a minimum amount of a higher, uh, uh, the heavier lifting, but you can concentrate a little bit more of your loading into the higher rep ranges. It's just as anti-catabolic as you're just better at doing it. And it's less likely to get you hurt and injured. And then maybe when you get back into massing, you can slowly work in to slightly um, more percentage of your work being in the heavier poundages. Um, also, like if a lot of your work when you're massing, especially towards the tail end of massing, is in the very, very high rep ranges, you end up just kicking out every exercise because of aerobic fatigue and you're not even stimulating the muscle properly. Like when I'm big and fat, I could do stuff like lifts like 500 pounds for sets of six and fucking put on muscle. But if you have to do lying hamstring curls for sets of 30, I'm just like throwing up in my mouth by the time I get to 20 and there's, I'm not even training my hamstrings, it's just my lungs. So James, anything to add there? Yeah. So it's kind of a funny conundrum because it ends up being a sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy where um, as you are deeper into a diet, as Mike already said, systemically and locally, it becomes very difficult for you to keep training at those high force outputs. And then it becomes more, uh, just more efficient for you to train at the kind of moderate to lower intensity ranges. So the first thing you run into is just the fact that you are now training in those higher rep ranges when maybe you hadn't been training in them before automatically starts making you better at them uh, just disproportionately fast. And some of those adaptations, like uh, especially when you're training for the higher reps, it's a lot of metabolic adaptation. It's not necessarily going to be a ton of like muscle tissue adaptation, at least in the beginning. And so you see the like, acute changes happening really, really fast. So you have this kind of one, two punch of like, well, you haven't really been doing that. So you started doing it because it became more necessary. And then you just started getting better at it as a result of doing it. So that's one of the reasons, at least why that does happen. And we do, as Mike said, we do recommend that people bias their rep ranges towards the moderate and higher rep ranges when they get further and further into a cut. And then the reason why you get better at them is because you're just doing them more <laughs> and you become more fatigue resistant for a variety of other reasons, like Mike already said. Lastly, number three, uh, if steps are significantly higher than usual, on any one day, should you add calories to your daily intake? Uh, and if so, how would you go about doing this? So I would say the only really good reason to add calories on a daily intake like that is if you really need to perform highly, especially with your legs the next day, and you really need to replace some of the lost carbohydrates. So then I would say finish off the evening with a couple of higher carb meals and then call, call it good. So if you walk around like an amusement park all day and you have to squat the day after and you're like, ooh, I really just want my legs to be nice and full and get a good workout, let's say you're massing or something, then yeah, I think it's a really good idea to finish off the night with a couple of big uh, high carb meals. But uh, if you're any kind of like normal plan, muscle gain, maintenance, fat loss, everything washes out on the average. So I wouldn't worry about daily adjustments like that at all. And if you have a few days where your steps are significantly higher in one day, you'll probably also have a few days that week where the steps are significantly lower. And motherfucker, I don't see people being like, oh, my steps are lower. And they just take like the rice they had on their plate and they go scoot and they just put it in the garbage. Like that's also just right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so if you, if you're going to add food for that, you got to take away food for the other. And that's just nuts. Eat the same food you do weekly. Don't change your food any more often on average than, than, than once a week. And then the, the steps should, you should have a, um, you know, if you're doing step tracking, which is clearly the case, if you're asking about step counts, then you should have a weekly average that you type into Microsoft Excel or whatever app stores it for you. And then your weekly average should almost always be right of the money. And then everything else washes out. 
actually, I'm glad this question came up because I'm actually dealing with this issue right now. And I think you'll see why I'm doing it the way I'm doing it. Um, I'm, so I was talking to Dr. Mike before uh, we started and I, uh, some of you know, I got two puppies. And if you've ever had puppies before, you know that they are just like pee machines. They just pee all the time. You don't sleep. It's very hard. So I've been in like a really foul mood and I've been sleep deprived for a few weeks. And today I got up this morning, I had my like break where the puppies were down to go train and I was supposed to do squats, uh, you know, uh, 315 for sets of like 10. The first set should have been 10, like without much, without really having to get super psyched up for it. I got under there. I did six for like, I just grinder and I was, <laughs> and I was like, dude, no fucking way this is happening today. And, uh, so th- I just, I can tell that like my fatigue is in a really bad state just because I haven't been sleeping and I've been running around with the dogs and dealing with all that stuff. So I've actually been slow, going to slowly start increasing my calories. And so I thought about that this morning and I went and double checked my weight and my weight was actually way down from what it should have been. I was, should have been around like 217. I've been, I'm at like 213 right now. So I had the combination of like bad workout performance, body weight is trending in a kind of negative way. Uh, and so now I'm going to increase my calories just to kind of combat the fatigue state that I'm in, but I'm not training, you know, like I'm not in a normal training situation. I'm in like a shitty situation, but that is an instance where you might consider doing something like this when you have outside circumstances. But I think like Dr. Mike said, for the most part, it's a wash. If you're under normal training circumstances, the averages are what you're working with. And I liked your point about people not, not when they're step, not taking yeah. food away. That's really funny. <laughs> All right, next up, we're going to scroll up a couple from that, James, and we're going to look at Michel Marinovich. Got it. He says, hey, docs, where would you incorporate top singles in powerlifting, uh, hypertrophy, strength, peaking mesos? Wouldn't top singles be in violation of direct adaptation of the first two phases? So not in violation, but definitely not on – remember, it's a spectrum, right? When we say in violation, we do, we do say that, and it's fine to say. And the answer fundamentally is yes, but just to, for a little bit more nuance, maybe it's not like violation, but it's like not the, not the greatest thing in the world. And uh, maybe the way we'd say it also is needs to be justified. Because people always ask us like, hey, can I do singles here? And, and then we ask them back like, why? And they're like, because I like them. I'm like, can you do any better than that? And they're like, no. I'm like, okay, well, maybe you could do better than that. Because at the end of the day, totaling whatever you total on the platform is cool and it's cooler than being able to tell someone after you totaled your second place total and turning you up to them and be like, yeah, but I really like my motorcycle that I did. Like, sweet, you're the man. Here's the the award no one gives you for liking what you've been doing. Like, you know, and, and unless that's cool with you, then it's fine, right? So is it a violation of direct adaptation in the first two phases? Yeah, to some extent it is. Why have a lot of top powerlifters trained with heavy singles almost all year long and not just peaking phases? Because numerically, there are a lot of people uh, that train in not in an optimal way. And, uh, but percentage wise, the number of people like that are lower. Uh, also a lot of the folks at the very top have already built all the muscle they pretty much need and can work on technical expression. Also, a lot of those folks are Instagram junkies and they do maxes all the time for the gram. So, uh, and, and maybe you see a small part of their training where they do, uh, uh heavy singles and uh, you don't see a whole lot of the other training. And, and a lot of times, again, they don't really do heavy singles. They do moderately heavy singles just to get a little bit of weight on their back. And it's not like an RP nine or 10 single. It's like an RP seven single. And they do a single just to practice singles because that's their sport, which is totally fine. You can always do that. We just don't want people to do very heavy singles all the time. That's a really bad idea. So most of the top powerlifting coaches don't have people do heavy singles. Sometimes they have them do moderate singles and most of the time they don't have them do many singles at all. And a lot of the top powerlifters is like, if you looked at all the top powerlifters, you would find that not so many of them do to, uh, top and heavy singles. And also used to be that everyone did singles all the time. It was West Side training and that's what almost all powerlifters did. That was wrong. And now we know that there's better ways to train that are more submaximal and more repetition based. And in 10 or 20 years, maybe even fewer people will do top heavy singles. So you don't want to exactly copy what the best guys do because they could already be out of date and just riding along on amazing genetics and drugs. Yeah, absolutely. Sing- I mean, doing singles is for uh, peaking phases and for Tinder, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, see what it did there? Um, yeah, so I think uh, what Dr. Mike was saying too, um, a lot of people do it for 
is basically like an MV for their technique under heavy load, which is actually not a terrible idea. But at that point, they're not doing like a true single. It's not like a 90% effort single. What they're doing is like a something they could do for like a three or a five, right? And then they're just really just keeping that technique under heavy load nice and crisp so that when they actually get back to training heavy, it's not as big of a shock or they don't have as much transition time from their other techniques. So I think that's a perfectly fine way of going about it. But people who are taking like, like actual like 90% or like, you know, RPE 910 singles during their hypertrophy phases or even during their strength phases to some degree, it's probably not the best use of their time or effort for sure. All right. Did you get a text from someone, Jamo? Yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm, on, I'm on some weird spam list. Oh, geez. All right. Scrolling up to cushion one three between the magenta L of Lucas Wernick and Ooh. the purple J of John. Got it. All right. Cushion 1-3 says, if I'm on an upper lower split, does it matter if I hypertrophy change the order of the days from week to week as long as I get four workouts in every week? I.e. week one, I do on, on, off, on, on. But next week, I do one on and one off. Uh, it doesn't matter a ton as long as you can checklist the um, two things. One, is your workout that you do, is there enough of a rest after it to make sure that you're really fueling gains as opposed to just hitting it hard again? And two, is your next workout done sufficiently fresh that you're not like weak and sore from the last workout you did? If those two things are, are correct, 90% of the concern is gone and any arrangement works fairly well. James? So this is what, yeah, like uh, I agree with Dr. Mike here. This is one of those things where like if you – really pressed me hard. I'd have, to, I'd have to concede that it's not a big deal, though it is kind of a pet peeve of mine. So I'd be more of a stickler on that and say, it's very difficult to track what you are doing when you have that much inconsistency and variation in your weekly schedule. So it's very difficult to know like if you did one workout and then the next time you do it in a completely different circumstance, different day, different time, different conditions, was this an RP or was my RIR two? Was it one? Did I match reps? Did I not match reps? It's very hard to like actually make a good judgment call on those things when the conditions are, when they differ greatly. So in that regard, I'm not, I, I would not want any of my athletes or clients or anybody to do that. But like I said, if you really pressed me, I'd say, yeah, it's probably not a huge deal so long as you're able to hit your, your main workout criteria and you're trained for hypertrophy. I think it would be a bigger deal if you were doing more sporting type activities, which were more intensity dependent. Like if you had to hit certain numbers on your lifts, if you had to do certain performance uh, milestones that you had to hit during your training, that might be a bigger deal. But for hypertrophy, I think it's a little bit more forgiving. comically frozen james oh yeah oh, not good. all right and then second part of cushion on three's question is also if i want to consume one gram of protein per pound of body weight and I weigh 170 pounds would a casing shape before bed count towards that day's daily protein or the next so it takes several hours to fully absorb uh i answer that very simply you should count it to that day because you consumed it on that day you can count it on the, to the next days, but then you'd have to count the next casein shake that night, night after on the next. And let's say instead of casein, you decide to go out with your friends and have two cheeseburgers, and that's the same amount of protein. Do you count the cheeseburgers you ate Friday night for Saturday? No, that's ridiculous. So count it for the day, and that's uh, super, super straightforward. Yeah, it's needlessly complicated. You don't gain anything by making it more complicated at that point. Yeah. All right, next up is just above that, and that is our friend, John, who has the greatest- <laughs> Just John. Ever, just fucking John. I can't believe he got that one. Um, he says or asks, if someone is an advanced quote unquote power lifter, can they experience newbie gains when switching to a hypertrophy program? No. As a matter of fact, advanced power lifters who have been, let's say, lifting very heavy and not doing hypertrophy, um, they've been doing it for a long time, enough so that they're getting very few gains very slowly. Uh, when they switch to hypertrophy program, nine times out of 10, they're going to get temporarily weaker because the neurological adaptations are so wildly different and the fatigue is so much wildly higher that they're going to be like, oh my God, like uh, this is making me weaker, but they will add muscle relatively quickly. So they're initially going to get worse. Then later when they start to do heavier training again and stop doing the lighter training, 
they stop doing as much hypertrophy work and switch more to strength work, especially if they transition well with intermediate reps. And even if they don't, and just go back to super heavy lifting, they're going to start to catch these mysterious gains out of nowhere. They won't be newbie gains, but they will be like intermediate gains. So uh, James, uh, anything to add to that? As I think it's, you know, the intermediate way is kind of a decent way of putting it. Yeah, no, you're spot on. So the thing with um, like the beginner gains is you can, you can, you can kind of branch off and look at different modes of exercise and different activities and break these things up. So a really, a really simple example is that if you have a soccer player, right? If they've been lifting for six years, you know, doing good intelligent lifting, their lifting training age is nothing like an intermediate, right? But if they've been playing soccer for 20 years, that means in the soccer context, they're advanced. So you can break it up a little bit depending on what the mode is. The problem in this case is the mode of resistance training is the same for powerlifting and for hypertrophy training. So the, the the way that you're doing it is slightly different. And so like Dr. Mike said, you're going to get a little bit more out of it, um, but not, not beginner gains. Yeah, so I think the intermediate analogy was really good. All right, let's go all the way up to the second to last to Abraham Lincoln, like Lincoln Park. Oh, very nice play on words. All right. Abraham Lincoln says, question, in a context of training for powerlifting, how big of a difference of results can one expect from doing a mini cut versus maintenance versus slight surplus during a strength phase for any, for say around an eight to 12 week long strength block for long term progress? This is a contrast to the latter having two dedicated blocks at what point though IDK to bring body fat to more optimal levels to start under the math and massing phase while the mini cut is safe four to six weeks on the form. So in the context of training for powerlifting, how big of a difference results don't expect from doing a mini cut versus maintenance versus a slight surplus during a strength phase for say. Okay. So is he, is he asking like the performance differences that we would expect to see across those conditions? Like, I'm not really understanding the question, I guess. I'm wondering if he's saying, like, oh, I see. Would the powerlifting performance suffer? So I think, yeah, okay. So I think he's saying a mini cut versus like a regular cut, uh, essentially. Um, I, I, like, he's clarifying here. So in my case, I find the mini cuts of four to six weeks are usually plenty to get me back into a reasonable body fat to start massing and have up to this point been doing them during my strength phases. But now I wonder if maybe I'm limiting my long-term progress by doing this. I don't think you're limiting your long-term progress, but I think that uh, we don't recommend mini cuts for our strength athletes because the deficit is so large that it takes your strength performance and strength momentum a lot. I think what's better for strength athletes, for physique athletes, that's fine. I think for strength athletes, you want your momentum to keep going. So a longer sort of uh, six to 10 week diet uh, that is slower in uh, a lower, lower in its you know, weekly deficit and so on and so forth can allow you to still get decent strength progress and then get to the same body fat. And then it can allow you to slow mass or maintain after that have great, great training. It never disrupts your training. There's a momentum to strength building and conservation and powerlifting that is very important to medium term progress, maybe in a long term. And by that, I mean, like for your next meet, for example, like for your next meet that's coming up in 16 weeks, should you do a regular cut or should you do a mini cut? If you do a mini cut, sometimes you get like objectively weaker. Um, and sometimes a mini cut alters your leverages so quickly and it gives you such low energy uh, so quickly that you have to drop a lot of load off the bar. That screws up your progressions and it can really fuck you psychologically too. And then you have to rebuild strength. It's really gnarly. What I'd rather see is a, a more conventional fat loss phase that takes a little longer, six to 10 weeks, where you have like really good training, but not the best training ever, but you lose fat and you keep your momentum. It's just slower momentum. So instead of, let's say squatting 405 for fives, if you start a mini cut, you might be or fives. Like, fuck it low. Yeah, back, like, it's raw for your momentum and everything. I would rather see start a four or five to five do the 10 week phase and be squatting only four to 10 the end of that. Or can you still hear me, James? Uh, I was, it was, it was kind of coming in and out. Okay. I fucking, I hate the internet. I love the internet. I take that back. Just like, no, it's, it's, it's not, it's, it. it's almost certainly on my end. So you're, you're, you're pro you know what I mean? Okay. So, um, yeah, okay, after six to 10 weeks, you only went up from 405 to like 410 or something like that, or maybe 415. 
but like that's still momentum you're building. And then when you switch to a, a muscle gain or maintenance, then you add and add and add and add. So you're like a really, really good place versus if you're in a mini cup, taking those like two steps backward to kind of take two steps forward, that's kind of rough. It can be pretty rough. And then it's just more mini cuts are, are uh, again, even, even if you manage to regain that strength, there's a little bit of perilousness involved in altering your leverages that much and that quickly. And you're not used to it. And it's really day to day. You have really shitty energy. We basically like James and I approach uh, athletic performance differently than we do. Atrophy, if you feel like shit, shut the fuck up, just grind the reps. If you can't get reps, add more sets. In performance sport, you don't, and this is something because James and I come from a coaching background, we literally coach performance athletes. You just don't want to do anything to really fuck with their performance, especially making it objectively worse. If you slow down the gains, that's way better than making it objectively worse because number one, they're there to have good training. And from a coaching perspective, like if I was coaching powerlifters and I had them do mini cuts, dude, I would lose all my fucking clients because they'd be like, I'm getting weaker, go fuck yourself. And they would fire me. And then maybe they're making the wrong decision. I don't think they are, but it's still from an athlete perspective, it's tough to have like, imagine you have worlds coming up for nationals. And someone's like, how are your lifts going? You're like, well, I'm in mini cuts. They're falling right now, but, but they'll be back up. Like, yeah, if that was a phase potentiated calculated trade-off, that'd be cool. But if it's not, it, it's just too extreme of a thing for strength athletes to be doing from a variety of perspectives. And we're bigger fans of just the slower, slow roll approach. Yeah, I, I def definitely agree. And I think this really highlights the importance of, you know, weight class athletes to, to really be on point with their body composition and their body weight, because you don't want to be fucking around with doing all this cut stuff all the time and having shitty training and seeing your performance go down. This is something that drives, you know, I, I'm, it drives me nuts. And I'm sure it drives Dr. Mike and just about everybody who's coached anyone before where they're like, Oh, i got this important meat coming up. It's the most important thing, but I need to drop like 30 pounds. It's like you fat fuck. What are you talking about? You need to drop 30 pounds. You're way overweight. And we're talking like tissue weight, not water weight, right? Like right. you're just way out of shape at that point. So the idea being like when you have your um, a weight class sport like powerlifting, you really got to stay kind of pretty close to your competition uh, body composition and body weight within some like pretty tight boundaries, more so than a lot of other sports, because you can't afford to spend a ton of time massing and getting really, really sloppy and then having to spend all this time cutting at a really, really slow pace. So I think what a lot of people do is they do a shitty job on their mass, blow up bigger than they're supposed to be. And then they think, Oh, I'll just do something. And I'm not, a, this, I'm not saying this is a job. Uh, whoever asked this question, I'm not saying this is you. Um, but then people will be like, Oh, I need to lose all this weight really fast. What about a mini cut? It's like, the point is actually to just not get that fat in the first place. So you don't have to have this problem. Yes. That's the real issue. Yes. 100%. All right. Coming down just a little bit. One question down. Some dude Norris. Clearly not Chuck Norris. I feel like some dude Norris is getting two questions answered on this webinar because one's rated seven and one's rated nine. So that's like, really uh, good. yeah. So that's really good. Keep it up. All right. Some dude says, I've never thought these claims have merit to them, but there are those that swear by it. Think about old school bodybuilding techniques meant to grow your rib cage, like breathing, pullovers, and squats. James, why don't you start off this one? So I've heard this too. I can't imagine that there's any merit to this outside of like being at like a developmental age where maybe, and this is like a big maybe, you might be able to expand your ribcage a little bit, but we're talking about like bones here, right? And so the other question is like, what is the purported benefit of this? Like, why would you want to have an expanded like trunk cavity? I don't understand what the, especially for bodybuilding, that doesn't seem like it would make any sense whatsoever. So I... Honestly, I don't, I think it's bullshit. I don't really have any good insight though. Mike, what do you think? Um, I, I don't understand how that would ever fucking work, bro. Uh, like what, what is, what are you supposed to get out of it? Even if it did work, you know what I mean? Like, what is the goal to make your fucking ribs bigger? This isn't like, yeah. this isn't like fucking Mad Men where you can do like, the more barrel chested you are, the tougher you are. You know what I mean? Like, come on. Yeah, kind of. I mean, and yeah, I guess if your rib cage was really big, then you would be bigger, but also then it would be awkward because your shoulder clap inter interacromial width would be the same. And then you kind of look like you have a big barrel chest, but narrow shoulders. And that wouldn't be a great look. So it'd be, um, be great for, for like big belly benching and powerlifting. That'd yeah. Be or like being an old timey circus strong man. Right? Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it would be terrible for like MMA because you'd have this like giant target of, of body that it people could just here. tee off on. Yeah. hundred <laughs> percent. All right. Some dude Norris. Next question. Upvoted a lot. 
says, I know you recommend a lower dotic spine for hip hinging. That works very well for me for RDL, but for good morning and SLDL, SLDL and RDL are the same, but that's neither here nor there. My erectors fail before hams or glutes. I found a neutral spine and an intense powerlifting style brace allows me to feel more tension in the hamstrings despite feeling less of a stretch. Uh, when determining best SFR, I am assuming feeling tension would be prioritized over feeling a stretch, yes or no. Yes, it would be. But also, why don't you just go lower and get both? So whatever we, you're doing to brace. Here's what James and I will say. If you can keep your spine relatively straight and you can get your hips to do the work instead of your back, then you're fucking golden. We're not going to judge you after that. So we're not going to say you got to be lordotic and stick your chest out like a fucking dying parrot. But like, yeah, just like keep your shit tight. Like if your back is fucking actively rounding and you think you're doing good mornings, you're not. So if you're getting plenty of uh, flexion at the hip, not the spine. And if you're getting, uh, if your knees are nice and back, so you get a good stretch. If you feel lots of tension in the hamstrings, but not as much of a stretch in that position, that means your pelvis isn't anteriorly tilted as much as it could be. That's okay. Just go deeper and it'll accomplish the same thing. So just go deeper and you have your both answers at the same time. So this, this, I'm giving you like the double stink eye on this one. Some dude Norris apologies in advance. So I'm just having a hard time. So like if your erectors aren't a limiting factor on RDL, I have a really hard time imagining that like the switch to SLDL or good morning, then suddenly they are, that seems really odd. I just, it would make me wonder what exactly you're doing to see that vast of a difference. I mean, like the good morning should, should be lighter in weight, first of all. So like, it would seem odd that that would be become a limiting factor for good morning uh, when you, your your RDL seems fine. So that seems a little strange to me. And then it, I understand it's definitely feasible to feel more tension through the muscle while not necessarily feeling more stretch. But at the same time, that seems a little, little hard to pull off more often than not. And so I think Dr. Mike's recommendation right there was, did the Zoidberg, why not both? Why not Zoidberg? Um, definitely go for <laughs> both. Um, but I kind of, that, that gives me like a little stink eye. Like, well, if you you're feeling tension, but no stretch. The, again, it, those things combined make me very skeptical of your technique. That's kind of really the, the root of the issue. So both of those things make me kind of giving you a little, a little stink eye. But it, yeah, I mean, it is possible to feel tension and not a ton of stretch, but I would try to get both like Mike said. All right. Next up is our friend from Brazil down a few notches, oh, green R, Rafael Sorge. <laughs> he had a good one last week about the copy bars. Yeah, that was amazing. So Rafael says, Master Mike and Master James, I heard you guys saying that stretch under load is independent way of hypertrophy, but uh, never heard. <laughs> Sorry, I thought the way he spelled that was awesome. Never heard of a few guys say how quite a munch, please explain. <laughs> Uh, so easy <laughs> stretch under load can be used in almost every exercise, some especially more than others by going through a full range of motion and pausing at the deep stretch position for a split second. So stiff like a deadlift. Good morning. Dumbbell fly, uh, pull-ups even, um, all kinds of full range of motion movements, especially with dumbbells and especially with barbells that let you go super, super deep. Uh, that's stretch under load. So stretch under load isn't something it, it is seemingly an independent uh, hypertrophic mechanism, or it, it allows you to essentially impose tension in a very, very intense way, on, on, uh, in a, a more particular way that's very hypertrophic. That we're not really saying that that needs to be a different thing. That doesn't need like oh, intraset load right. stretching or something like that. It should be a part of your repertoire, and is more reasoning to do full range of motion. That's really what it is. It's like, hey, why should I do full range of motion? Well, here's a good start. This is why. So that's, that's one of the reasons we say that, James. Yeah, and this is just like Mike said, this isn't something you have to add. It's just something that is already covered in full range of motion training. And the, there were some other programs back in the day. There was like with the S FST7 with it was like power oh, yes. stretching in yeah. between. Like that's not like you don't have to do that kind of stuff. Really, it's just like can you move through a full range of motion under control, feeling tension through the muscle, mind-muscle connection, all those things. Boom, check mark, done. All right. How many Perry, was that? We got a couple more? We got two more, I think. All right. Perry Battles. Uh, has also kind of, a sweet name, Perry Battles. Yeah, he's got some kind of mentally retarded man 
on his logo or whatever. <laughs> All right. Harry Battle right. says, Hi, Doctors Mike and James. How necessary slash beneficial is an active rest phase for intermediate trainees? I've heard Dr. Mike say that active rest phases are superior to maintenance phases in many cases because they drop the same amount of fatigue or greater for more structure, specifically connective tissue, in less time than a four week maintenance phase would. That being said, I've also heard it said, pardon me, I forget where, that the active rest phase is not really as useful for intermediates. Would you therefore preferentially recommend maintenance phases to intermediate lifters over active rest phases? Thanks. As an additional note, I really appreciate your work. It's helped me a lot of my training and in my studies. Well, that's very good, uh, Perry. Thank awesome. you so much, or whatever the fuck your real name is. Um, but uh, so I would look at it from uh, Perry James here. This is a needs analysis situation. It's not like an intermediates versus other people. It's like, what do you need right now? If you are going to be maintaining your dietary intake anyway, not either massing or cutting, and you need to train still, and you need to maintain for eight weeks because that's how much time you need to take off from massing your cutting for your metabolism and everything and psychology to get back to normal so you can do that shit again, then you're not going to have to rest for eight weeks. That's for goddamn sure. Uh, so you're going to do a maintenance phase. So maintenance phase is something you can do to drop fatigue and to resensitize for hypertrophy, mostly the latter, not the former, um, when you are not specifically gaining or losing uh, mass uh, weight or muscle and fat and so on and so forth. So in some of those maintenance periods can last a while and that's where maintenance training is irreplaceable. Uh, in addition, maintenance training seems like a real good idea for beginners because they don't really need active rest because they're not burnt out and uh, there's not much damage going on and they could still work on their technique a lot and get stronger. Uh, and that is something that the maintenance phase is really, really good for them. And also maintenance phase is great for them because it keeps them in the training habit. Because so you don't want to just let beginners off the hook for two weeks because it just never come back, right? So for them, maintenance phase is good. But for intermediates and advanced, it is, do I need to train for a long time and not gain or lose weight? And if the answer is no, but I need to draw some fatigue and I feel like I can do it in two weeks with an active rest phase, then an active rest phase is superior to a maintenance phase. So for example, if you get to a certain point in your diet and you need to take a break, but like, uh, so here's a good example. Um, you've done a fat loss phase and you're pretty beat up, but like you can go right into massing after, but you're really fucking beat up. Do you do a four week maintenance phase? No, because like, why the fuck are you maintaining it a lower body fat and all that's kind of fucking stupid? You don't need to be there for four weeks. You could just turn around. So if they're an active rest phase, is a great idea. You do two weeks of active rest and you're fucking golden and you're good to go. Um, whereas a maintenance phase is something like, you know, you just did a diet that was really, really hardcore and uh, you're interested in doing another diet later that's pretty hardcore, like fat loss diet. Well, you know, two week active rest is not enough time to give you a break between two diets back to back. So you're going to take maybe an eight week maintenance phase with maybe an active rest at the end of one of those, like a one week active rest at the end of that last maintenance phase. And then you're going to do your next fat loss diet. And that's because you need the time. James? Yeah, I think that's a great answer. I'm going to come at it from a slightly different perspective. Um, I think at the intermediate stage, you have kind of a combination of two things that are occurring that, you know, like the athlete has gained a lot of training experience, but they still need some guidance at the same time from their coach or whomever they're working with. Right. And so to really get to that advanced stage, whether it's sport training or hypertrophy training or anything, eventually the athlete has to gain more incrementally, more and more and more autonomy over their own training programs and their own decisions. So I think at the intermediate stage, we're not probably going to see uh, the coaching style and the relationship with the athlete really determining whether or not they need like a maintenance phase, aside from the factors that Dr. Mike already mentioned, um, whether they do a maintenance phase or an active rest phase. So when you have athletes who you're trying to build their confidence and autonomy with the program or whatever it is that you're doing, you might opt for active rest phase because it puts the ball in their court and allows them to make some more decisions about where their life is going. Whereas uh, in other situations, you might say like, Coach knows best. You're going to just trust me on this one. We're going to do a maintenance phase. I just need you to chill for a couple of like a mezzo or two, et cetera. So I think at this point um, you have your needs analysis decisions, and then you also have kind of like your interpersonal relationships with the, between the coach and the athlete to making good decisions about the, the athlete's future, but also the rapport between the two. So I think the active rest can be useful when you're trying to, you know, build up the athlete to becoming more and more independent and making better decisions on their own. And the intermediate is like right in between, right? They're like, they have some experience, but not enough yet to make those good decisions. So the coach is what is, is who helps them kind of decide which ones are better choices. Yep. James, would you like to answer the last question about, oh my, slow versus twitch, fast twitch determination. <laughs> slow <Strength>. versus twitch. <laughs> 
Uh, Where is this one? I don't see it. So this is at Epilemos for Life. He has one question there. He has another uh, rated question that's, are Delos always at, uh, at RP6 every session that week? Or would you like to answer um, uh, Farhan Buddha's Dilan's question of uh, dieting in a deficit and strength training versus hypertrophy training? Which one of those suits your fancy? It's our last question for the day. Ooh, hold on. Okay, so there was determining if you're fast or slow twitch. Yeah. Versus strength training on a cut. Mm. Versus what RPE do we do on a deload? Ooh, let's do uh, RPE on the deload because I feel like we've already touched on those other ones quite Super. a bit. So our deloads, uh, Eplemos for life uh, down below Lucas Wernick. Um, he basically like his picture looks like Jesus Christ. Um, our deloads always at RPE. He's almost six. certainly like a Norwegian death metal artist. 100% or a huge fan. <laughs> uh, our deloads always at RP6 every session of that week. So Grain of truth is that they're no higher than RPE six. <laughs> um, the it really just sort of depends on how you measure RPE. So if you're measuring session RPE, which is actually very difficult to do, um, then yes, uh, RPE six or lower. We actually prefer an average of RPE five or below. Like RPE six is already getting into that realm of like the uh, RPE six is something in the gray area between things that are, are not adding fatigue and things that are adding fatigue and stimulus. RPE seven. You can train at RP7 to get gains. RP6 is like, eh. Um, RP5 is like super easy. So we'd actually like for sessions, we'd actually actually probably recommend below RP6. RP6 is just in that borderline of like, do you really train this hard? Now you could do an RP6 session or series of sessions early in the week. And then later in the week, do a, an RP4 or three series of sessions. And then you're fucking really good to go. Um, as far as lifts, though, there are lifts as if, you know, because you're using RP, then we're talking powerlifting here or weightlifting or strength sports, not hypertrophy, because then we just use RIR. Um, can you do lifts in your deload that are RP6? Yeah, you can do RP7 and 8 lifts. It just has to be very few of them, and they have to probably be earlier in the week. But as far as you're looking at sessions, it's like, look, let, let's say you do, and this is, again, why session RP is a bit of a dubious measure. Session RP is work for, like, uh, team sport athletes and other people, like soccer players that have to give you one feedback on like they don't do very distinct things in their training it's all a bunch of stuff mixed together and then it's an hour of that and it's like how did you feel right but for powerlifting let's say you did an rpe8 squat like that's pretty fucking hard right but like you did two rpe8 singles did a set of leg extensions at rp4 and then went home what is that session rpe even if you didn't do the leg extensions rp4 you just did two squats at, at rp8 is that session really RP8? Well, compared to all the other sessions you've done in your accumulation phase, motherfucker, that's like an RP3. Like you just warmed up essentially and went home. So uh, I don't like the session RP idea for strength sports a ton, but I think the lifts within your session uh, can be quite high RPE. I would say that anything over eight RPE is really begging the question what the fuck you're doing with it on your deload. So I think even the six, seven and eight RPE lifts are fine lifts as long as the session overall is a very, very low volume. And later in the week, you should be doing RP, even the lift should be RP five and below. James? Yeah, that was good. I, that was the direction I was gonna go as well. So in strength and power sports, you might have activities on your deload, like a sprint, for example, where it's like, can, uh, can you sprint at like an RPE like six or, you know, it's like, eh, it's not really a sprint. That's like a run at that point, right? So right. there's just some activities like powerlifting, weightlifting, you know, track and field events come to mind where, yeah, you, you just can't get around that. But as Mike said, the point is that the, it's the session as a whole is much, much, much easier, right? So there might be a, a few individual components within your deload where you had a couple like kind of hard or just intense things that you were doing, whether it was the weight on the bar or the amount of effort that you put into it. But overall, you should walk away from that feeling like, whew, that was nothing. I'm feeling better. 100%. James, my count might be off and I'll be getting better at counting. I switched counting methods halfway through, but I believe that's 10 questions that if it's nine, we'll do 11 next time or some shit. But uh, I think that's it. All right. Well, guys, thank you very much for joining us on a, a new format. We appreciate the engagement. So there's like 50 comments on that last one. So that's really awesome. So we're really glad that you guys are engaged and, and hanging out with us and listening to our nonsense. So same format for next time. This one will get published uh, in hopefully in a couple of days. And then you can start posting in, uh, your questions or upvoting questions that you like. And we're going to take the top 10 most interesting ones or most upvoted ones from there. Lastly, before we go, guys, um, 
when you post your question, our huge recommendation is do this. Post your question. If you want, like your own question. I don't know if you're allowed to do that, but if you are, great. Like at least two or three other questions. And not just randomly. Go through them and see which ones you like. And that way, it's going to be really good because even if your question doesn't get answered, you get a little something. Don't just post your question and let the mob like the questions because you'll be perennially disappointed with which questions are getting answered. It's never fucking yours, right? So uh, like a couple of the top questions as well as your own. And then, um, you know, that way we can make sure that, you know, we get good data on really upvoted questions and then answer those. So that's that. And it might be good not to drop a bomb load of questions per per post. Like somebody today posted several separate questions that got mass and got both of them answered. And I think it's one of those where if you post like a big bomb, <laughs> everyone's going to ignore you. So. Yeah, for sure. If you ask like 50 questions and, and also we reserve the right to like, if you ask 10 questions or one question, we're just going to move on to somebody else. Cause like it's one, technically speaking folks, it's one question per question. Uh, we could just answer one part of your question. We usually answer most parts. If it's like two or three parts, that's totally cool. But like, motherfucker, if you put like, uh, who did that shit? Let's call him out real quick. Fuck. Oh, no. Manchus Filipuchis, our friend from Lithuania, um, is six distinct questions. Now, Manchus, I, I know, motherfucker, I know you want to know shit and you're a real sharp guy, but like, let's winnow that down to three and we'll be on that shit like white on rice. And he got a, a lot of upvotes. He got seven upvotes. He should have been in our account today. But like, God damn, man, let's winnow those down. Like next time, winnow those down to the three you want to answer the most, we'll, we'll kid him off. And then next time, ask another three or some shit. But seven is like intense. And, and that's like, it's not like we're bothered with it. We have, we have the time. It's just like, it's kind of, a, not, I don't know, unfair is a weird term, but like, it's kind of weird. We're answering bad seven form. of your questions, bad form. Answering seven of your questions, and then we don't even get to some of the people who ask just one question and we're not voted, so. Yeah, yeah, and maybe post a, if like a couple of those separately as, because they might be, people might be like, oh yeah, fuck yeah, that one, boom. Yeah, oh, and one question, I, I'm not gonna answer the actual question, but it's a sub question real quick I have to get to, and uh, hopefully we'll answer your question next time. Uh, Farhan, where is Farhan? Uh, yeah, oh, there he is. Uh, Farhan Piruzilan. Uh, so he's asking, I, I said earlier that his name sounds like a Russian curse word. Um, and it, it's like, it doesn't sound exactly like one, but Piruzilan, it, it sounds like like Piruzilan, which is just a way of saying your name and putting vagina in it. Uh, <laughs> it's like, it's like, you see like a, like a Swedish guy's name is like Pussy Ostrov, and you're like, <laughs> Okay. <laughs> oh, like don't grow up in America with that name because goddamn. So if you grew up in Russia, chances are Russian assholes would, you know, say unkind things to you your entire life until you became an adult. And then they would say them behind your back. Russia's great. Russia. Right. Well, it's like imagine growing up in America if you're like people like grow up with a name like Dick. Like, I don't even know how that works. Like Dick Cheney. Like clearly he must have gone by Richard when he was a kid. But there's no fucking way you got can you imagine like your mom, like, you forget your lunch and you're walking through your neighborhood to school with the other kids. Your mom's like, Dick, you forgot your lunch. Like, what, mom, are you serious? Richard, please don't say Dick. Please, for the love of God, stop calling me Dick. Ugh. Ugh. Folks, don't name your kids stupid things. And with that, we'll see you next time for the next webinar. Oh.